pause. <laughs> Literally has all of that. Welcome and welcome back everybody, Tia here, and in today's video I'll be sharing with you my top 10 favorite solo board games. Now quick disclaimer before we get started, I have not played every solo board game known to man. I know, shocking. So if there's a game you feel should be on this list, one that you enjoy, want to share with me or anybody else watching, please leave it down in the comments below. I think the best part of being part of the board game community, even me, solo board game community is being able to connect and share our love of games with one another. Without further ado, let's get started. So to start things off at number 10, we are already breaking rules because instead of just one game, I have two plus to show you. And these are the Clever line of games designed by Volking Varsh. We have our OG Ganshun Clever as well as the newer Dapeltso Clever. And there's actually a third Clever game that is currently in the works. These games feature the roll and write mechanic, however, they feel quite different from other games. You'll be using dice to check off boxes, but on your turn, you will be drafting three dice from your own turn and then taking one die from any other player's turn. Taking a higher value die or the color die that may score you the most points in the short term may hurt you in the long term because the higher value dice will cause you to discard any dice featuring pips that are lower. So this mechanic of selecting the three dice and drafting within your own die pool on your turn really lends itself well to solo play. The full game does play between one to four players in about 30 minutes, but I would say for solo play, it's 10 to 15 minutes maximum. These games are very abstract. They might not be for everyone. However, if you're someone like me, where your brain just fixates on specific mechanics, running through them over and over and over again, trying to max out and get the most points, this might be a great one for you to check out. You can definitely play through it very quickly and very efficiently. This one definitely consumes my attention each time I play it and helps me just block out any other distractions and have a nice break in my day or a nice break during gaming. So I would definitely check out my number 10, the clever line of games designed by Wolfgang Varsh. Coming in at number nine, we have Spell Smashers, which was designed by Christopher Chung and published by Renegade Games. In this game, you are going to be defending your town, aptly named Solo Town, against the oncoming threat of monsters and eventually a final boss. Now, unlike in other tower or city defense games where you may be rolling dice or playing spells, tapping cards, in this game, you are going to get a hand of cards that has specific letters and you will be playing them in order to form words. That's right. This is a word building game. Now, it may seem like a word building game doesn't really fit with a high fantasy theme, but in this particular game, each of the letters has different elements and things. You get to level up different gear, which will give you bonuses to how you construct your words and how you can damage enemies. And in addition to that, the enemies that you defeat based on the first letter of their name will become part of your engine and be a letter that you can use in future rounds. I absolutely love the integration of word building and the high fantasy theme with this game word building games as much as i love them can tend to feel a little bit dry or lean on the very simple well it's about books which there's no problem with that but this one is just so fresh and new with how it integrates it into a, a really interesting high fantasy theme obviously the art from vimiko on point as always just gives it that extra pop of excitement this game does play up to five players and in the multiplayer game you will just be trying to destroy different creatures and get the timing of that right to rack up points i personally prefer the solo game i like the idea of defending a town a little bit more there's more sense of urgency to the story and it's just a little bit more immersive in my personal taste but if you like word games and you've been looking for a great solo word game to check out i would definitely recommend spell smashers Next up at number eight, we have Set a Watch, which is published by Rock Manor Games and designed by Todd Walsh and Mike Nade. In this game, you have a group of adventurers that is tending to their camp and fighting off hordes of enemies that are coming in waves throughout the night. This game is a little bit more straightforward in terms of its combat. You have unique characters that have different dice that you'll be utilizing, as well as unique abilities, which will change from game to game. It hits on a lot of the kind of tropes that we may have seen in gaming before. High fantasy, dark, dice, combat, cards. 
However, this game puts it all together in such a fantastic package. In addition to using your different members for combat, you will have to assign them to do other somewhat menial tasks, but important ones, such as chopping wood for the bonfire. And so the timing of when you use your characters for combat versus for some of those other auxiliary actions is really interesting mechanically. I think in addition, the arts on this game and the production could have gone very, very stale. But luckily, <laughs> We had, I believe it was four different artists and two different graphic designers who worked on the illustrations and putting together this game in a very amazingly attractive and juicy, yummy package. Don't be fooled by the size of the box either, although it is quite compact. There is a lot of game here and a lot of replayability. Next up is one of the newer games on my list, and that is Warp's Edge, designed by Scott Alms and published as part of Renegade Games' solo hero series. This game is primarily a bag builder in which you'll be purchasing new chits to upgrade different attacks and maneuvers in order to obliterate enemy ships and eventually the large alien mothership. This is one that I personally really love the mechanics of deck building and bag building, so I'm a little bit biased here. However, I'm also biased in the other direction because I don't typically seek out games that have to do with a sci-fi or a space type of theme. This one has such great presentation though. I think just the mechanics of bag building are really solid and how you can get those different chits. There are different maneuvers that you can activate from game to game as well as new different ships that function differently and will force you to change up your strategy, different motherships as well and different enemies. And I think that the progression of adding new enemies into the deck of harder levels really gives this one a very nice and exciting game arc to it. Each time I've played, it's been an absolute trip. So if you were waiting for a sci-fi game on this top 10 list, here it is, Warp's Edge. My number six pick is Flatline, made by King Clinko and published by Renegade Games. This game is based off of its predecessor, Fuse, and is the aftermath of the bomb going off. In this game, you are playing as doctors in a hospital, rolling dice to prescribe different medicines and treatments for your patients before they perish. This game does have a real-time element, so you'll be able to set up each round, plan a strategy, and during that real-time element, you only have one minute to get the perfect die rolls and assign them to the most important priorities within your hospital. I absolutely love games that have real-time elements, but also present a lot of depth of strategy. This is a game that does that so fantastically, and whether you're playing solo or even with up to five players, this is one that scales well at any player count. I personally really like playing it solo as well though because you do get two entire sets of dice. So it's quite fun and very challenging. And again, there are a couple of different things to manage, including your patients, emergencies, you can get different bonuses that will help you in future rounds. The timing of when you cure patients is even really important. I've never worked in an ER room or anything, but I think it probably has that really high energy vibe where every second counts. So if you also enjoy real-time elements in games, I would definitely check out Flatline. Coming in at number five, we have The Maiden in the Forest, designed by Todd Sanders. In this game, you are playing as a maiden trapped in a forest. You will have to utilize objects to move tree cards and get them into the correct alignments to rotate and then eventually flip them, which will allow you to escape. This seems like a very simple game. However, it is so absolutely elegant and stunning in its design. This is a game that you cannot just go pedal to the metal with. You really have to use restraint and plan ahead, something that I'm not always the best at doing. But I think that the theme and the artistry of the game, some of which was completed by Todd Sanders himself and some by Fabrice Weiss, is just really ties it together to make a really unique and spectacular package. So there's definitely more than meets the eye to this one. Again, I'm a huge fan and have huge respect for any designer who chooses to tackle such a small footprint game and manages to pack so much in. It's just, it's mind boggling to me. And this is one of the best examples of those micro games that I have personally seen. So I would definitely check out Made in the Forest if you're looking for another smaller game to add to your collection. 
Next up we have not just one, not just two, but an entire stack of games and these are the Oniverse series designed by Shetty Torve and published by Z-Man Games. So I'm just going to set these down right over here. Strap in youngins, time for a little bit of a history lesson. Urbion, this is a small card game in which you'll be playing cards with different uh, point values of positive, negative, dreams, and nightmares in order to balance out the universe. Oniram, which is a card game in which you will be playing cards in different patterns and combos to unlock doors to the Oniverse. This game, as well as the rest of them, play from one to two players and feature a variety of different expansions that you can choose to include or mix and match in any capacity. This game does feature a lot of shuffling, but for me personally, one of my favorite activities growing up was just to put on some chill music and zone out, play some different solitaire card games. And this definitely has that feel, but with a lot of production value and interesting theme, the arts by Elise Plessis, not sure how to pronounce it 100%, is just absolutely fantastic. Some people have said it has like a childlike quality to it, but I think that's part of the charm and it's done in such a way that it's like very high art kind of focused um, and it really adds to the overall theming. So that is Oniram, Sylveon. This is another card based game. However, it's very different. In this one, you are setting up a tower defense where you're trying to protect the trees and the forest from these little fire sprite critters. And again, it is one to two players and features a lot of different modules that you can add in at your leisure. Castilion, this is the first one that was not purely a card game. In fact, it is entirely made up of different tiles and you're going to be constructing a castle, placing different types of little duders <laughs> and their different shapes in order to trigger specific effects. This is another one that really requires you to plan ahead and use some restraint because as you destroy or use those effects, your tower gets smaller and you do need to lock in some specific combos from round to round. Nautilion, this is another one that uses cardboard chits. Instead, you're gonna be placing them out as a spiral and you are essentially trying to get through and race a pirate ship this one does feature dice as well. Last up and most recently is Arion. So in this one, you are constructing different blueprints of flying structures up in the sky. And this one does rely heavily on dice and similar to that Yahtzee mechanic of rolling and trying to get different combinations like straights or same numbers. And typically these games can feel very stale. However, the dice manipulation in this one is so high, especially with some of the alternative expansions that you can add in. I personally find that this is one of my favorites from the series and is really satisfying and enjoyable to play through. So all together at number four, we have the entire Oniverse series. And again, those were designed by Shadi Torbe, who <laughs> this isn't even his day job, guys. If you didn't know, he is an opera freaking legend, which like Bringing it back down in scale at number three, we have a nine card micro game, and this is Orchard, designed by Mark Tuck and most recently published by Sideroom Games. In this game, you'll be overlaying nine cards to create an orchard. As you overlay cards of similar types, you will increase pips on dice, which represent the types of fruit growing in your orchard. Now, this game is extremely small in its footprint, but it is so much fun to play. I like to think about my games as food. If like, you know, Nemo's War is a nine course meal and the Oniverse games are a steak dinner, this little guy is like the most exquisite truffle you have ever tasted. It is so yummy, so delicious. And it's another one where there is a lot of planning ahead. In addition to that, I think the community around this game is so fantastic on Board Game Geek. They have monthly challenges, so each card is numbered and you can play with as many people as you have copies for. So it's a really awesome solo game. It has some multiplayer rules in there as well if you want to challenge friends and things like that. And this is just a fine specimen of a micro game. Coming in at the number two spot, we have another game from designer Kane Klinko, and that is Dead Men Tell No Tales from Minion Games. You have probably played a cooperative game before. You may have played a game where you are a pirate or where you are looting treasure. Maybe you've played a game where you are a firefighter or fighting undead armies. Maybe you've played a game where there is a kraken. Pause. Dead Men Tell No Tales literally has 
all of that. It is the whole freaking package. In this game, you are playing as a pirate that is looting a burning ship that is also being overrun by undead skeletons. And to top it off, if you have the expansion, you are also trying to kill a kraken. This game has so much adrenaline packed into it. It is super fun. As I said earlier in this countdown, I am not a person who is particularly invested in theme in a game, but when I am playing this game, I literally, I, I feel like I'm there. It's amazing. Now, in terms of how the rounds play out, each person has a character. You're gonna be tracking your different items that you have that will help you manage different aspects of gaping with your treasure. You also have fatigue, which you'll be facing based on the heat levels. This game does borrow from some of the similar mechanics found in some of Matt Leacock's cooperative games such as Pandemic and the um, Forbidden series where you'll flip cards each round which will increase different levels of fire and trigger different effects. But this game takes all of that and just amps it way up with one of the most unique themes of games and presentations that I have seen in quite a while. So if you, that sounds like an exciting time for you, definitely check out King Clanko's Dead Men Tell No Tales. Coming in at the number one spot is one of the oldest games on the list, but it just goes to show how solid of a game it is, and that is Antoine Bausa's Ghost Stories, published by Repos Productions. You are playing as monks defending a village against spirits and different evil entities that are encroaching upon it throughout the night. You will be moving your monks around the board to activate different villagers, which will help you in various ways, some with proactive measures that will help you prevent spirit spawning and others that will help you to banish and exercise them. The number one complaint I hear from people about this game is that there is too much RNG. <laughs> there is a lot of RNG with the dice. However, I have found in my many plays that it is all about the prevention of RNG and relying on the die rolls only as luck in a positive sense. So there are definitely some times where it can pile on. However, in my personal experience, I can definitely say that as someone who typically really steers clear of any games that rely heavily on luck, this does not feel like it's particularly in that category for me. Now, additionally, there are some expansions. My personal favorite is the White Moon expansion in which you have a special guardian spirit. You will be able to erect these pillars around the four walls of your town and engage in max exorcism. If you can't tell, I'm getting very excited here. I'm trying not to literally just scream and freak out. This game is so immersive and it feels so freaking cool to play. There is a dedicated solo mode. However, let's be honest here. Of all the games that you could like just OD on, this is the one where you have to play as all four monks by yourself and just control the whole team. It is so fun. It's so fantastic. It's very juicy, very, very difficult, which gets me really excited. That's what hooks me and makes me want to play again and again and again is when I can see a strategy forming and a pathway up. And for that reason alone, not to mention all of the different expansions and things, there is so much replayability. It is a fantastic game. If you have not checked out Ghost Stories, which has been out for over a decade, you absolutely need to. Ghost Stories by Antoine Baza, my number one pick. Surprise! There is a tier zero on this list, and that is Real Road Inc. Y'all didn't honestly think I was going to make a top 10 list of solo games without including the fantastic folks over at Horrible Guild, right? I am probably the first person to become overly skeptic when a game has multiple editions released. These games, oh my gosh, shout out to Lorenzo and Hjalmar, y'all done did it with this game. Honestly, every time I open up a new mini expansion, it's like Christmas times 11. And I love that the expansions are all thought out. There's so much flavor to each one. There are different difficulties of easy, medium, and hard. So no matter how many brain cells I have left or lacking in my head at that moment, there's always an expansion that kind of fits the vibe and the mood that I might be feeling. 
I personally really love drawing and art. It gets me into a very mindful headspace and these games definitely integrate that very well. So, you know, understandably this game might not be for everybody, but for me, there's so much replayability, so much variety, so many different factors that go into it in terms of emotion and vibe and difficulty. And not to mention there is a freaking epic board, okay? Literally called the epic board. Hello. My name is Tia. I like board games. <laughs> and also the dedicated solo mode, like, so fantastic. So my tier zero or my favorite game to play solo is definitely the Railroad Inc. collection of games. So there you have it. Those are my top 10, 11-ish favorite board games to play solo. If there are any that I left off this list, ones that you enjoy that you would like to share, again, please leave them down in the comments below. I always love finding new solo games and being able to connect with people who also enjoy solo gaming, as that's not something I necessarily get to do in my day-to-day -day life. If you found this video enjoyable, please feel free to leave a like. You can also subscribe down below for more board game content. Thank you so much for joining me, and I will see you next time. Bye. My number six pick is...